uh, I have a special treat for you tonight. Um, we have one of Washington's top insiders. For 50 years, the Honorable Robert Keith Gray has been a well-known, well-respected uh, advisor to five presidents, uh, countless companies and candidates, senators, congressmen, etc. in Washington. Uh, he probably has the biggest Rolodex in Washington, even still today, is active in all kinds of Washington uh, and national and international political endeavors. He has a MBA from Harvard, he went to Washington and became President Eisenhower's appointment secretary in the White House. And he was such a valuable asset to him, the president made him a member of the cabinet and he served in that position as, uh, as secretary. Uh, so he was right there with President Eisenhower throughout his terms. Now remember, they were the Eisenhower-Nixon years. So it's probably safe to say that nobody knows Richard Nixon better than, than Bob Gray because he worked with them as vice president. He saw him as Eisenhower uh, made him his indispensable aide and dispatched him uh, throughout the world. Eisenhower knew that Richard Nixon knew Congress and he really didn't because he had been off fighting wars and he knew, he knew the Hill he knew the policies, he knew the legislation, he knew the issues, so they made a great team. And Bob Gray was right there with them. He later went on to help Richard Nixon in his campaigns. He also went on to help Ronald Reagan. Uh, he was as close to Ronald Reagan as I think anybody in Washington. He was deputy director uh, of the, of the uh, co-director of the, of the inauguration. And, is, is, and when I went to Washington as a young man, a country boy from, from the San Fernando Valley, because I had been asked to help on Senator George Murphy's campaign back in 1964, I was but a child, of course. Well, I was. Why are you laughing? <laughs> well, that's rude. Uh, but I went to Washington with Senator George Murphy and... Bob Gray was one of the first people in our office. He was with Hill and Knowlton, the preeminent uh, public affairs firm in the world, and certainly the most influential in Washington. And he helped us, uh, uh, he guided us through in, as we got to know Washington, because we, we were all newcomers there. Um, Bob Gray built Hill and Knowlton, and then he went into his own firm, Gray and Company, and years later, Hill and Knowlton realized they had to have Bob back, so they bought a majority interest in Gray and Company, brought him back, and he became worldwide chairman. Uh, so uh, Bob's influence, his fingerprints, his footprints are everywhere in Washington. I'm proud that he's my friend. Uh, the Nixon family love this man, always have. Uh, he's been a good friend and supporter of, of things Nixon throughout his 50 years. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to talk about presidential perks gone royal, the Honorable Robert Gray. <clears throat> thank you, thank you very much, Sandy. It's a real privilege to be here. I, my affection for Nixon is, is deep and long lasting and I have a thousand stories I'd rather talk to you about and you might rather hear about than the book I'm going to talk to you about tonight. <clears throat> I think it's only fair for me to start out with a, uh, uh, with a uh, not an apology, but at least a confession. This is the book that you came to uh, hear about tonight is not the book I intended to write at all. I started out to write a book last year, and I've had a chance to uh, be involved in various administrations in years past, as, An as Sandy has indicated, and I've had a chance in some of those occasions to sample some of the presidential perks, the toys I call them, because presidents have a lot of, a lot of leeway. Uh, I knew that in, uh, in Truman's case, for example, uh, he decided, as there's a picture in the book you'll see, of bulldozers running around inside the White House. 
he decided that the White House needed some shoring up, so he had the whole interior gutted, totally gutted, the whole thing. Left the outside standing so the public wouldn't have too much concern that something had happened at their famous house and lived for two years in Blair House while the reconstruction was taking place. That was just um, one president's uh, idiosyncrasy. Um, I know that in, uh, in the Bush administration, uh, George Bush Sr. had a running track started in the White House around the driveway, and Bill Clinton came along and tore it down. That's a privilege the president has. Richard Nixon decided he was good the, the swimming pool over that space, over the press. So he had the swimming pool floored over, made it a press room. Presidents have lots of leeway. I, I think perhaps my, my biggest offense has always been with Jimmy Carter, who is a Navy man, and a fellow Navy man in my case, um, sold Sequoia. Sequoia was the presidential yacht and was used as a presidential tool. Uh, president Eisenhower and, or well then Governor, or General Eisenhower, and President uh, Roosevelt met there to talk about D-Day. Uh, President Nixon uh, told his family he would resign aboard the Sequoia. Jack Kennedy had his uh, last birthday present, uh, present aboard the Sequoia. And uh, it's a very, very famous, very famous boat. Anyway, Jimmy Carter summarily sold the Sequoia. The presidents have that kind of authority. And I've always been amazed that the public was not too much concerned about the authority that presidents take upon themselves or the license we give them to take it upon themselves. Um, one famous example, of course, is when President Roosevelt decided he wanted to see the, uh, what is now Camp David, and he took over 118 acres that had been reserved as a private uh, recreation point for civil servants and public servants, and took it over for the exclusive use of one person in the civil service, the President of the United States. Anyway, presidents have great latitude, and I thought it might be fun to write a book about this, I, since everybody last year seemed to be running for the presidency, as you may remember in those primaries, it seemed like everybody was running for president. I thought I'd call my book, I Don't Want to Be President, I Just Want His Tax-Free Toys. <laughs> and I thought it'd be a good title and be catchy and people might like to read about them. So I started writing the book and I hired two research assistants to help me. We started analyzing what's happening to the toys and how they've grown, how they've changed over the years, administration after administration. The book took on a very serious tone the further we got into the research. I, had, I thought I knew something about presidential toys. I had absolutely no concept to the size of which they've grown and out, totally out of proportion without any control at all. You know, all of our government, with enormous checks and balances all over the place, there is not a single check of balance. There's not a single person of authority who can say to the president, any president, no, you can't do this. No, you can't have that. All a president has to do is decide this is what I want, and it happens. This is what I need, and he gets it. Something, something's wrong in a government, a democracy particularly, that has, a, has a, a leader who can run so totally out of control if he wishes to do so. We're only left with the president's conscience to keep a president from going totally out of control. And it's my contention, based on this book and the facts we've found, that we've gone now to the point where the presidential perks are out of control, totally beyond belief. It's one thing for the, for the White House to be expensive. It is expensive, of course it is. But do you know that it costs $35,100 a day to maintain the White House? It doesn't pay any taxes, they don't pay any insurance, they don't have any, any upkeep, but they don't have to worry about anything except the help. And right now, the help that runs the White House, and the ladies in this room will appreciate this, there is one employee for about 100 and every nine, 109 feet of space. That's about the size of a 8 by 10, 8 by 12 rug. There's one employee for that much space. Outrageous. And the same thing has happened all across government, particularly in the presidential side. President Obama today has, has a total of 492 professional titled assistants. Uh, President Nixon had something like 20. Um, Roosevelt had six. 492 titled. These are not secretaries. These do not include staff people. These are not minions. These are titled people. Over 200 of them are paid over $100,000 a year. 27 of them are paid $174,000 a year. It's an enormous galaxy. If you wonder who's running the government while the president's out campaigning all the time, 
These are people you didn't vote for, you don't know the names of, they're not responsible to any of us. They have to be the ones running the government. The president, in addition, now has 43 czars. He has czars in every conceivable field. The report only to him. They're not confirmed by the Senate. They're not uh, obliged to, to uh, hold by the uh, standards of no government any other way. They're, they're totally immune from the, from the, the uh, Secrecy Act. They don't, they don't have to, uh, uh, to uh, testify before the Congress if they're called. These are people totally immune to any other government control except the president. It's a president running a government of his own. The czars are in several fields. One czar, for example, is a czar of Homeland Security. We also have a secretary of Homeland Security, Janet Napolitano. She has 58,000 people reporting to her and a budget of over a billion dollars. But still the president has a czar in that field reporting to him. These are, these are, these are encroachments that have gone along over the years. Bill Clinton had eight czars. Uh, George Bush Jr. Had, had 23 czars at the end of his eight years, and Bill Clinton, or, uh, uh, Barack Obama had 43 at the end of his first eight months. We're going totally out of control, and the public has no control over it, no contest of what's going on. Perhaps the, the biggest expense, the biggest concern I have today is the mounting expense of Air Force One. You know, when, when, uh, when Richard Nixon was taking trips for Dwight Eisenhower, he traveled on the Columbine. The Columbine cost the taxpayers a total of $47 million. The two Air Force Ones cost us two-thirds of a billion dollars. They're enormous, enormous planes, two-thirds the size of a football field, most, most totally equipped, most beautifully maintained airplanes of the world. If you fly a 747, and these are modified 747s, you fly one today commercially, there will be five cabin crew to serve several hundred passengers. On Air Force One, there are 23 cabin crew and five full-time chefs. Overabundance, every place you turn around, where one will do, two, two are occupied, where two will do, four are there. It's just the, the redundancy in government has gone totally out of control on the executive branch, and there's no control over that facet of government. There, there are other uh, examples in the book that uh, might be of interest to you, uh, Camp David being one of those. Uh, Camp David, of course, is, is uh, uh, the uh, presidential retreat most famous because it's often pictured whenever a visiting head of state is visiting the president of the United States there. That's very seldom its use, however. Very seldom is it used for visiting heads of state. That's when the public thinks that's its primary use because that's when you always see the pictures in the paper. You don't see it when the president and his family and campaign contributors and relatives and so forth are there. But it's, it's a very expensive process. There are over 400 CBs, these are um, civil uh, or, or members of the Navy, who are there when the president is in residence. They're not there to protect him. These are not security people. They're not addition to security staff at all. These are there to cook, wait on the, the president's family, campaign contributors and so forth who happen to be there with him. It's, um, it costs, um, according to one estimate, uh, John Bloom in his book says that it costs $28,000 just to run the president back and forth between Camp David and the White House. And when you think of that, uh, and think of the fact that the president has a pretty fine establishment at home with, with all the facilities of a country club, you kind of wish that more often presidents would stay in the sanctity of the White House rather than Camp David. The White House itself is, is something to be considered. Do you appreciate, uh, if you've been there, how many of you have been there as a visitor? <clears throat> well, you know it's a beautiful place. Do you, are you aware of the fact that what you saw <clears throat> was two corridors and five rooms out of a 132 room mansion? It is, it is certainly a magnificent place and should be. We want it to be. We want it to be perfect and it is perfect. But it's 132 rooms, 28 bedrooms, 42 baths, 17 fireplaces, three, three uh, elevators, and magnificent spaces all over the place. What you see as a tourist you go down one long corridor, you go past the presidential uh, library, you go past the presidential movie studio, you go past the presidential China rooms, past the diplomatic reception room, down a corridor, which you're seeing is four walls, down a corridor, eventually you're directed up some stairs, you go through the green room, the ballroom, the red room, the state dining room, and then you're escorted out the door. The president, the president of the United States has 132 rooms 
at his beck and call. For his friends, family, relatives, campaign contributors, nobody else stays in the White House that the president doesn't suggest. And they can uh, have their kids uh, practice chopsticks on the uh, grand piano in the ballroom if they want, or do their homework uh, in the red room, whatever they wish. The, the facility is theirs, except for the couple of hours a day, five days a week, that the, the public is there on public tour. And not, not to minimize it, we want our presidents to have grand style. We want them to live well. But every, every space, every, every uh, expense is spared the president. We give them totally free living, with one exception. Presidential families have to pay for the cost of ingredients of the family's food. That's the only thing. Not for its preparation or service or anything else. The, the floral bill alone in the White House is over half a million dollars a year just to keep the first family in flowers and tables and so forth. But everything else is taken care of. They don't pay heat, light, electricity, um, and the telephone. Uh, there's no expense. No expense. Every any expense that might come to my mind is covered for them. The only thing the president would need money for is for his own use if he wanted to buy a pack of gum or something when he's outside someplace. Everything else is paid for. His cost of his, his housing expense, his, his office expense, uh, the newspaper, the television, everything else. Everything is free. And it's beautiful living. Not to minimize that, because it's, it's marvelous. And we want them to live marvelously. But the expense of the government has to be considered, and these expenses do mount up, and they mount up extraordinarily. The, the cost of running Air Force One today is $181,000 an hour. When you realize that when the president takes Air Force One and goes from Washington to Denver, say, that's 1,500 miles, uh, but uh, three hours, two hours, we'll say it to, to cut it down, four hours round trip, that's almost a million dollars right there in, in the cost of Air Force One. If he raises a million dollars, we'd be better off to give him a million dollars and say, please don't wear and tear our airplane and stay home. <laughs> it would be much money ahead. More often today, the presidents uh, make uh, campaign speeches uh, off and on all across the country at the same time that they do business. Uh, for example, in Colorado, there was a fire, forest fire this last month, and the president had three uh, campaign speeches raising money in, those, in the uh, Colorado Springs area, stopped and talked to the fire victims, so wrote the whole thing off and paid the government nothing in its recompense. Um, they, we're supposed to have a question and answer period, and I guess rather than talk extraordinarily long, I'd like to respond to questions you might have, or specifics you might have. But let me, before turning it open to questions and answers, let me ask you this. Let me ask you to, to support a movement that I want to start, to get a one-term presidency. Not starting with this president, of course, you can't do that. It can't be this campaign or the one elected. But let's get in the future. Let's set the side and make it any time you want. Make it six years, eight years, whatever term. But as long as we have a president set on a two-year term, there's no question but what every president is going to be tempted to use his first four years to get himself reelected to the next four years. That doesn't give us the best presidency. We ought to have somebody who knows that his, that his record is going to be, history is going to judge him on the term he has, whatever length that is, and do the best job he can to serve the country rather to serve himself. We have too many examples. In this case, uh, President Obama was, was sworn in on the 20th of January, and then the, on the 14th of February, the next month, he had his first campaign, first political campaign. He flew Air Force One 117 times the first year he was in office on campaign business. He flew Air Force One to Ohio to swear in some local police officers. He flew it, flew it to Chicago twice to shoot some hoops with some of his friends in Chicago uh, in, on basketball. Uh, flew it to Ireland to uh, visit a pub named in his honor. Uh, flew it down to Cape Canaveral so his family could see the, the, the rocket launch. I mean, it's no, nobody, nobody but the president's conscience involved in controlling these, these expenses. And if you have the country of high unemployment and, uh, and heavy economic woe, it's worrisome to have a president that doesn't seem to have any conscience about how, much, how he spends the money or how much he spends. Let's take questions. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank, thank you. I remember uh, reading something about Nancy Pelosi flying a plane out here uh, for 
quite a few years during when she first got into office and either her or her family was able to fly a plane out here to California back and forth and uh, eat up a lot of expenses. What does somebody in her position able to do? And, and then she, apparently she got caught or something and they stopped it, but how does that work? No, I'm so sorry, but you need to repeat that for me. If it, or you repeat for me, I don't care at all. It was about Nancy Pelosi and what she was able to do in her position, and apparently she flew a plane. I was reading something talking about her flying the plane out here uh, back and forth to Washington once a week, either her or her somebody in her family or friends for quite a few years and eating up tons of expenses before this got stopped. How is somebody in her position able to do this, and what are the checks and balances she, on that? Well, she was, uh, Nancy Pelosi was Speaker of the House Rep Sunday was when she managed to do that and was given an airplane, which is uh, surprising. The previous speakers that I know of didn't have airplanes assigned to them, but she flew it back and forth to her home uh, district every, every state. I think uh, that, that probably is more forgivable than the comment she made about the health bill saying, let's pass the damn thing. You can always read about it tomorrow. Um, but uh, that's, that's not forgivable. Of course it isn't. And it's, uh, it's no longer the case happily. Bruce, thank you for visiting our area. And um, all the presidents have entertainment when they, you know, have big events. Is this entertainment free or do we pay for it? I was so sorry, kid. The entertainment provided at, at presidential events, is it free or do we as taxpayers pay for it? In most cases, it's free. Most, most times the uh, uh, entertainers themselves uh, look for that opportunity to, to say, I, as I performed last week in the White House and so forth. We, we, they do pay for some, but not for much of it. Most of it's gratis. Yes, sir. Uh, could you comment on the pension benefits of an uh, ex-president? I know Jimmy Carter has been retired since 1980, and I'd just be kind of curious how many hundreds of millions of dollars and pension benefits he might have gotten for four years of service. And of course, uh, Barack Obama will have four years of service, but 40 years of retirement uh, time. Do you know what the formula is for the benefit of a pension? They, they continue to get, uh, they continue to get their, their pension for the rest of their lives. The more grievous case, I think, is the, is the Congress. The members of Congress serve one term, could be a two-year term, and they get a pension for life and they get uh, a pension for themselves, and if something happens to them, then their wife gets it in, the, in their stead for the rest of her life. And every time there's a raise in the pensions in the United States, they get a raise. Every time the Congress passes a new, new raise for itself, they get a raise. <clears throat> Which brings me to a point I would like to go back and, if I could recoup bit my previous comments, talking about the presidential staff and the fact that some of these 27 of them now are getting $172,500 a year. Uh, that came before Congress. Congress uh, heard about it. So Congress did what Congress knows how to do best. They didn't tell the president, you can't pay those people that kind of money. They said, that's more than we're making. So they raised their own pay. <laughs> so we're now paying 535 people $172,500 a year. Be a good point, though. Next Can you tell us about one of your early trips on Air Force One? Um, Yes, I'm, I remember I hardly sat on the seat. I was so excited. Um, but it uh, was an early, uh, early trip, and it was the old Columbine in those days, and Eisenhower's plane, which by today's standards is, uh, is very modest. Um, the, the new one is, um, is something else. It really is unbelievable to see it. We, we, I think we all want our president to be we're, we're proud when he lands in foreign land and lands in the best plane in the world, but it's, uh, it's unbelievable. Um, to, um, to think of the luxury that's involved in it. It's, uh, it's glove leather and, and uh, uh, teak wood, and it's, it's magnificent inside, but it has, has a gym, it has uh, a movie studio, uh, enormous space everywhere, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it really is, uh, it, it's, it's worth running for the office just for that plane. <laughs> yes, sir. <coughs> In your research, did you find out how many trips Michelle Obama has made on vacations since uh, they took the White House on Air Force <coughs> One? Yes. 
uh, she didn't. She did not make her uh, uh, most all but one of her trips on Air Force One. She made them on uh, on planes of that uh, size and and uh, cost, but not Air Force One. Uh, she made uh, the trip to uh, Marbella, Spain, uh, one of the first trips. But she took um, seventy of her uh, friends and so forth along, and, uh, in which she listed her two daughters as staff members. Uh, the 10 and 12 year old daughters of staff members to get them uh, included as well. Um, and uh, there's no figure that I've ever seen that accurate that tabulates how much it costs in the Secret Service and the extras, all the other. The, the cost of her transportation was estimated by US News as $14 million. But uh, how much more is involved, I don't know. Uh, she's had, uh, you know, that's an interesting uh, bar play of staff. Uh, in uh, Mamie Eisenhower's case, when I was first in the White House, Mamie had one staff secretary, uh, social secretary, she was called, uh, and uh, she, that's how she ran the, the White House. When Jackie Kennedy became uh, first lady, she had six in the social office. Michelle Obama has 24 in the social office, and she pays her chief of staff $172,500 too because the president pays his chief of staff $172,500. Her, her total staff bill is extraordinarily high. And uh, it, the, there, are no more, there are no more official dinners now than there were two administrations or four administrations or six administrations ago. There are more dinners there, but there, there are social functions of, of uh, fundraising capacity and, and political nature. But the, uh, the, all, of, all the First Lady has to do, uh, technically, we don't pay her, so she shouldn't have to do anything, but all she has to do in a state dinner, since the State Department has a social office that makes all those arrangements, she has the finest chefs in the world to prepare for the meals and set the tables and the floors to take care of the flowers and so forth. All she has to do is to get into her dress for the evening, and she has, also has someone to help her get into it if, if that's required. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Bob Gray. <laughs> thank you. I want to end with just one personal note about Richard Nixon. I had a long relationship with Richard Nixon and I kept that relationship going thick and fast through all the years when he left the, after he left the presidency. And at the end of his life almost, uh, you know, Pat died a year before he did. And I sent him a note and I said how sorry I was and so forth and we talked about other times and all. He sent me back a note, which obviously I have, and I'm going to give to the library someday for its keeping. And he said, uh, we talked, for, he wrote for quite a ways, and then he said, you know, Bob, it occurs to me that in all the years I've been writing to you, this is the first time I haven't said, have it closed by saying, and Pat sends her love. But I'm sure she does this time, too. Ladies and gentlemen, as you know so well, but perhaps uh, uh, Mr. Gray doesn't, we give these lavish gifts to our speakers, and tonight is no exception. Tonight, of course, is the what would Nixon do mug. The question that was probably frequently asked in the White House when he was there, uh, as they were sending him all over the world representing the United States, and they, they would... Uh, they would talk about him, and this will be a valuable asset, I think, and I hope on his on his desk. Bob, thank you for coming. Mr. Gray will be. Thank you. Mr. Gray will be. He's now going to the lobby where he'll sign your books. If you don't have a book, they're available in our museum store. But please join us in the lobby, and he'll be glad to inscribe and sign. Thank you for coming. Ladies and gentlemen, we want you to know that we're proud and honored to be in the world's greatest Navy, protecting and defending the greatest country.